we can show honor to the native keepers of the land by recognizing the value of their culture, by learning the truth of their history and how it shaped this great country. I'm always in awe of the fact that my native brother wrote that, gave it to me and said I could read it and I could share that. And so I share that before each Learning Cafe session because it means a lot to me as well. So our speaker today, and I'm just thrilled that she's here. She's just totally amazing. If you've ever heard her before, you know that you're in for a treat. Beyond pilgrims and mascots, the true meaning of Native American Heritage Month since 1990, and I'm sharing her words, November has been recognized as Native American History Month, a time to celebrate the diverse history, cultures, and contributions of the indigenous peoples of the land now known as the United States of America. However, indigenous people have not always been accurately portrayed or honored in the United States, and many people are still not aware of the true American history as it pertains to Native people or are only aware of a narrative based on deficit. In this presentation, the speaker will provide an overview of Native American history through the perception of dominant culture, starting with the 1700s to the present. You will learn the history of false narratives and marketing of indigenous people and how this has contributed to current disparities and equities. You will also have an opportunity to learn about modern Native Americans and current efforts to shift the narrative from deficit to one of strength. I'll speak today, very wonderful, Ms. Bettina Park. She's a Menaju Lakota. She's the executive director of the tribal state relations for the state of Minnesota. Her biological family comes from the Cheyenne River and Standing Rock Sioux tribes. Her adoptive family is Osage. Over the past 20 years, Ms. Park has worked in the native community, both with tribal governments and urban communities. She was appointed Director of Tribal State Relations by the State of Minnesota Governor. She has done so well. She has led all of the major emergency repairness, preparedness um, around COVID for the tribal community. Um, she was promoted recently this year within the governor's office to Executive Director of Tribal State Relations which is a newly elevated position. She serves as faculty for the Falmouth Institute for the past 10 years. And because of our own experiences as an adoptee, Ms. Park is passionate about issues related to Native American children and families. She was approved by the United States Department of Interior University from 2015 to 2019 to provide tribal consultation and training for federal agencies. As a lawyer, Ms. Parker focused her early legal career on advocating for Native American families involved in Indian Child Welfare Act cases. She also served as an appellate court judge for the Prairie Island, um, Island Sioux community. And she taught federal Indian law. And there's so much more I can say about this wonderful person but you're gonna hear a lot of that from her and you will not hear it from a better teacher than Ms. Bettina Park. Can I give you the floor? Oh, thank you so much, Fanny. It's so good to see you and to be here. And I apologize to you all for uh, being a klutz uh, because I literally fell the morning of, of the last, almost what, two and a half weeks ago, almost three, uh, and ended up in the hospital in the ER for a few hours. So nothing's broken, but I'm still bruised. Um, I, I did a number uh, on my uh, left leg and right ankle, but I'm glad I can be here now. Uh, it's humbling to hear uh, someone talk about yourself. <laughs> oh, um, I am I still a, very much a work in progress and I've just had a lot of opportunities and my life has been very blessed um, for the opportunities I've had that give me a chance to talk about these things with everyone. So I'm going to share my screen now. So let's make sure that this works and everybody can see it. How's that? Can you see it? 
Yes. All right. Get a thumbs up from Elijah and, and, and some thumbs up. Awesome. So um, having a conversation here, I'm going to start it here, though, with just uh, a little quiz, a little pop quiz. Right. So if you want to put your responses in the chat. Um, also, as we move along, if you have questions, uh, either hold them or put them in the chat. And at the end, I have time where I can I can answer them um, or answer any other kind of things that that come up. Uh, it's always hard in a remote world um, to have an interactive dialogue, but I, I do want to make sure we, uh, if I get your questions answered. And Fanny has my contact information too, so if there's any follow-up, please feel free to reach out. So the first thing I'm going to ask is, how many of you have heard or believe Native people receive free government benefits simply for being Native? free education, free health care, heard those. Well, that is partially true. Um, the fact remains that um, all land in the United States is in essence stolen. Um, and as a result of that exchange of land to create the United States, um, treaties and agreements were made with the tribes that exist in perpetuity by their own language um, that have these kind of promises for health, education, food. I met a, a woman out east um, who worked for the federal government and every, I think she said five years, she has to deliver a certain kind of Muslim fabric to the tribe in exchange for that agreement in their treaty. Um, there's only one place I guess in the world now that makes that type of Muslim fabric, but they still go through that process because this exchange is not about services or welfare. Um, this is about a contractual agreement that one government made with another. And then to layer on top of it, we have several, several uh, years of Supreme Court decisions as well as federal law that have just recognized this trust obligation that the federal government has for the tribes and for tribal members. How about this? Do all Native people live on reservations, or at least most of them? Well, actually, um, the vast majority now live off reservations. Here where I'm at in Minnesota, um, I just went through the census this past week because for a different issue and learned that about 16.8% of Native people are identified as living within the reservation borders of the 11 tribes that are uh, within Minnesota. But because of federal relocation efforts we'll talk about um, that took place mostly in the 50s, um, up to eight, in, out of, eight out of every 10 people um, of Native people are in the urban areas. Uh, Los Angeles, New York being some of those metropolitan areas that have the highest number of Native people, uh, just because of the volume of the size. But, you know, even here in Minnesota, the Twin Cities, Minneapolis, St. Paul, is where a vast majority do, in fact, live. Do, how about tribal governments themselves? Are tribal governments all located on a reservation? assuming you know what a reservation is too, right? We'll get to that. Well, there are 574 federally recognized tribal nations within the country. There are 324 federally recognized reservations. So you can see there about 250 of the tribes do not have reservations. Um, and there are tribes within California, for instance, who don't have a land base at all. So they're federally recognized, but they don't have a, a specific land area that is theirs. Um, or you might be like the Ho-Chunk Nation um, within Wisconsin who does not have a reservation, but they have purchased and own lands throughout 16, 17 counties within the state um, that is tribal land, but it's not considered a reservation. How about this? All native people and tribes have gotten rich from tribal gaming, tribal casinos. We hear that a lot. When I used to run nonprofits, I'd hear that. Have you asked the tribes? Um, would be a question from, from foundations. Have you asked the tribes first for money? Um, well, the, a few tribes have in fact raised substantial revenue. There's a handful of them who have a lot of money. Um, however, for most of the tribes who have gaming, that gaming revenue goes directly into their tribal services, health, welfare, housing, um, 
clinics, policing, or it will support the actual government infrastructure itself, the building, the electricity, the you know, fleets, uh, because tribes do not have a tax base. So they aren't taxing their members the way the United States or other state, city, county, local governments do in order to generate revenue. Casinos have been able to provide that revenue for them. Uh, per capita payments or individuals who get payment directly from it, not a lot of tribes actually do that. And our Native American cultures, are we basically all the same? Kind of a pan-Indian approach here in the United States. We all wear headdresses, we all ride horses, all live in teepees. Well, think about it this way. The tribal communities within the United States come from all over the United States. And if you think about people who live in Florida, for instance, compared to people who live in LA, are there differences amongst those people um, on how they view things, their, their culture, their politics? Um, yes. So obviously, same thing for the indigenous people. We've been here, um, you know, we say for time memorial, but a tribe that um, is from and grew up in the area around say the Great Lakes here in the Midwest would have a different experience than those who, who are from the Southwest and more desert, right? So the environment will have an impact um, now, whether they're rural, urban, on reservation, off, you know, all these things are gonna have an impact on the way they um, exist. And even though there are, there are a lot of similarities uh, you know, we have fry bread all over the country. Um, powwows are common all across the country. Uh, there are a lot of differences that exist as well. And uh, would note that even before first contact, tribes interacted with each other. There were entire trade routes. Um, there were government meetings uh, that were taking place here uh, between the sovereign tribes that existed uh, even before the, the United States. So many of our highways, in fact, freeways that go across the country follow old paths that were already in existence from the people who were here as the easiest way to get from one place to the other. So how do you think you did? Um, did you know all the answers? Do you feel like you got a good education around it and so you were confident in your responses? Probably not. I think it's getting better now than it's ever been in the 20 years that I've kind of done these types of trainings, but there's still huge gaps in just general knowledge about who Native people are and particularly in a modern context. But, you know, it's not taught in our school systems as American history, even though Native American history is American history. Um, it's usually seen as a separate class. You take Native American history in order to learn that information. You will learn all about Lincoln and everything that happened around slavery and, and how he worked as a president, but you'll never learn that he also signed the death warrants for the Mankato 38, which is the last and um, largest mass hanging that this country ever, ever did um, for native people who were uh, considered um, dangerous at that time. You, you don't learn that, you know, even when Minnesota became a state, for instance, we have a picture of Lincoln in our, uh, our legislative um, chambers uh, because he was the first president the state could uh, elect and vote for when they became a state they don't ever mention the fact that in exchange for like Minnesota becoming a state and supporting Lincoln is why he agreed to the Mankato 38, which was Dakota um, people who were killed. We don't know these, we don't have these connections. Or if you hear anything about Native Americans, it's all about the past. Um, most textbooks, most classes will start around early 1900s and then go later. And so when we think of Indians, oftentimes the first thing you think of is an old Indian chief, a black and white picture, a sepia picture, uh, you know, cowboys and Indians, the wild west, even though there is a whole modern experience uh, for native people right now. So we need to talk about a little history uh, and some narratives uh, to get a appreciation as to why we're in a world now that 
any kind of discussion around indigenous history or indigenous education for all will result in a lot of tension and unhappiness in, in general populations or a sense of unfairness. Like why, why are Indians getting special things? Why are we talking about them? There's so many other. Um, it's easy to, to respond that way because we just don't understand kind of the overall experience itself. So let's do a little history. First one, of course, Columbus. This song um, I found on YouTube, right? It's uh, Mr. Mike TV. He does all these little videos for students. Um, this video had had over um, almost 350,000 views since it's been posted nine years ago. Uh, and it's still a um, narrative that we learn in school that Columbus discovered this country, this, this, this the new world. Well, we also know some facts around the what took place when Columbus was in essence lost. Uh, he thought he was in the Indian Indies Islands, not India. Like there's some some people say, well, he thought he got all the way to India. No, Columbus was looking for the Indies Islands, which are those old set of of islands over there on the other side of the world. Uh, he didn't realize when he hit this other island that it was a new place. Um, but we know from his writings, um, you know, he sent letters back to Spain uh, on, on what that interaction was. And you can see here, he noted right away the peacefulness of the, of the native islanders. Um, and because of that, they would be able to enslave them easily. Um, he, uh, you know, Columbus started essentially the, the sex trafficking trade uh, because he sent uh, women back to Europe um, to be sold. And he notes in his writing how girls nine to 10 were in high demand. Um, and this last one I think is important to, to highlight because for the indigenous experience in this country, it's not just a, you know, a challenge and we have to work through kind of this history with the federal government, but we also have that similarity of, similarly around um, the church. Right. Um, he says here that, you know, in the name of the Holy Trinity, you know, in the name of God, sending slaves and resources back to be sold. So he, he believed like he had um, the papal dictate to go and kind of conquer and, and um, civilize the world, which was common for um, kind of the dominant narrative at that time. But what we also know is the island that he hit, he never hit the main continent. He's never stepped foot in the United, what's now the United States. Uh, when they landed on the island, they estimate around 8 million people were there um, by 1496. You know, just a few years later, that population had been cut in half. Um, and by 1508, the population was under 100,000. From the violence, from the disease, just from the interaction uh, with Columbus and his men coming over, uh, it had a disastrous impact on, on that tribe, around those indigenous people. But we celebrate Columbus here in the United States, and we have a long history of it. Um, in fact, 1792, shortly after the Revolutionary War, right, and the country became the country, United States, we had the first celebration of Columbus landing. Um, we also uh, have a proclamation uh, in 1892 for the 400th around Columbus being a pioneer uh, and progress and enlightenment. And in fact, the World's Fair of 1893 uh, was focused on Columbus and commemorating him for discovering this whole new world. Now, um, I would also point out that at this time, that we were celebrating and beginning to celebrate Columbus here in the 1800s was also a period of time of intense assimilation and kind of the destruction of, of traditional tribal governments and recognition. In fact, for those of you who have heard of the Wounded Knee Massacre that took place in South Dakota, um, that was uh, just before this. But Columbus Day, man, here in Minnesota, someone toppled that statute um, on the grounds and we still hear from legislators and the public, when are we going to put the statue back? Uh, because he is still seen in this kind of false narrative of being um, a great explorer, uh, a unifier for Italy, uh, Italians. And in fact, when he became, when we 
um, when it was proclaimed a national holiday by um, Franklin Roosevelt, one of the reasons is because there had been um, some violence against Italians. And so this was the response the United States had. I also like to talk about Pocahontas. How many of you have seen the Disney movie Pocahontas? Pocahontas, excuse me. Um, at the time for many of us, it was the first time we'd even seen a native person being represented within um, a, like a, a dominant, like a cartoon, right? You've probably heard the story of how as a young woman, she threw herself over John Smith to save him when, his father, when her father was trying to kill him. Of course, Disney, right? Um, and even in the United States Capitol, there is a painting um, here of the baptism of Pocahontas um, when she traveled over to England and was baptized into the Christian church. But uh, not a lot of people actually kind of like learn a little deeper about Pocahontas. Um, but we do know some things. We, we know she was around 10 to 12 when she met John Smith. So the idea that Disney kind of presented of, of a very like a sexy Pocahontas, uh, in fact, Disney executive asked for her to be drawn that way uh, was inaccurate. Uh, in fact, the ceremony where she supposedly rescued Smith was actually a ceremony where her father was honoring him and acknowledging him as this leader of the colonists that would have given him special uh, privileges with the tr other tribes in the area. And children weren't even allowed at that ritual. We hear stories of how she snuck out at late at night to first take food to the people at Jamestown uh, because they were starving when relations with the tribe started to go badly and how she warned John Smith about this um, group that was gonna kill him from the tribe. But we do know for a fact that Jamestown was over 10 miles away from where the tribe was located. Uh, and you needed a 400 pound dugout canoe in order to make that trip. So it's very unlikely that a 12 year old would have been able to do that. We also know that Pocahontas was married um, and had a child with another one of her tribal members uh, prior to her marriage to John Rolfe. Um, and that she died during her 21st year of life when she was returning back to the, her homelands from England. Um, she had a meal on the ship and took ill immediately after eating that food and died soon after. And so uh, the, the, her tribal, uh, her family that exists now um, feel very strongly that she was poisoned and they didn't, you know, they didn't want her to return back from England. Now, why would we give a false narrative about Pocahontas? Like, why is this necessary? Well, you know, first off, John Smith was trying to sell his book. He wrote several books about his experience. Um, his letters that he wrote back home at the time never mentioned this Pocahontas rescuing him or her coming to bring food, like this kind of um, romanticized version of this rescue, this woman. Um, however, his book did. He, he never claimed a romance with her, um, but this did become kind of this model of how tribal and white European relations should be under colonization, that, you know, the enlightened Native people would, of course, support it. Um, and then the ones who didn't, you know, the savages like her father trying to kill or starve out um, were bad, right? And interestingly enough, most likely it came, this kind of narrative and false um, stories around Pocahontas came out in the, the 1800s. The early 1800s into the mid, there was a, a lot of effort to kind of build unity around the United States um, as a, you know, a, an organized government with states' rights and federal rights and unity after the war. And so because most people didn't read you couldn't do it through, you know, writing newspapers. So plays were used in order to kind of build this national identity. And Pocahontas was just a very popular one. Um, you can see here, there were several um, plays about her and this is where she became older. There was romances, right? Because they're trying to make a play. <laughs> they want people to come. They want it to be um, enjoyable, you know, a hook. But it also, again, is like 
pushing this idea around what is a good Indian, um, the, the activities that Pocahontas was doing versus the bad ones, which in the 1830s and 18, you know, 38 to the 50s is when a lot of the um, kind of tension over land on the east side of the country was building. Um, so the bad Indians are the ones who, who are fighting that. The good ones are the ones who are welcoming colonization. Um, so this idea of her serving as a symbolic permission um, for colonization and particularly settler colonization um, as a better, more civilized way and the better way. Now there's other narratives we hear like uh, pre-revolutionary war. Um, there were like the upper left picture depicts like there was a lot of communication, interaction, uh, discussions amongst the settlers and the colonists and then building up to the revolutionary war and even the beginning of the United States, there was government to government interactions going on. There were battles, of course, there was, um, you know, murder and, and kind of massacres on both sides as well, but there was also a lot of diplomacy going on. Um, and then we get, you know, uh, the Boston Massacre, which is in the upper right uh, in 1770. You know, it started as a street brawl. Um, people were frustrated. Those British soldiers were around. They threw uh, snowballs and ice and some um, shells and more reinforcements showed up and started firing into the mob, uh, which killed five colonists and wounded six. Uh, what's interesting about this too, if you've seen this picture is Crispus Attucks um, was seen as the first victim of this massacre. Uh, as you can see him being shot there, he was of African descent, um, but what has been left out of a lot of history books is his mother was Wampanoag. So he was a black Indian. Uh, he was a Wampanoag and of African descent. There was a lot of interaction between tribes and um, slaves and freed slaves at the time. And you can imagine for those coming across from Africa from a tribal community, they had far more in common with the indigenous people that exist in the United States than they did with those who had um, you know, sold them and were all proper, you know, owning them as property. So there was a lot of intermarriage at the time and continued uh, throughout kind of the East side um, during the colonization. But he is seen, you know, often talked about as only being of African descent, but I encourage you all to learn more about him uh, because for most tribes, um, they are matrilineal in identity and descent. And Apparently this man was raised with his mom and, and raised to be Wampanoag too. Then we have the Boston Tea Party in the bottom left. This one always makes me laugh because it's like a huge temper tantrum that resulted in the Revolutionary War, right? But interestingly enough, you see all the Indians are, are there throwing the tea. It's because a bunch of white men dressed up as Indians in order to do this because they wanted any kind of consequence to fall on the Indians, not on them. Um, so there was a lot of presence. And then of course, the signing of the declaration in the bottom right, where we are acknowledged. Um, you might have seen this phrase out and about, the merciless Indian savage. That is the only mention of us within the Declaration of Independence. And the actual sentence says, he, meaning the king, has excited domestic insurrections amongst us and has endeavored to bring on the inhabitants of our frontiers, the merciless Indian savages, whose known war rule of warfare is an undistinguished destruction of all ages, sexes, and conditions. So a narrative here of creating, you know, the savages, unhuman people who are kind of standing in the way of the um, freedom of the colonies uh, with the, the king. And of course, the United States Constitution here, we're only mentioned three times um, when they drafted it, uh, excluding Indians not taxed, um, because at this time it was still very much government to government treaty. And as you learn history and you dig into it, it's become very clear to me that until in very recent times within my lifetime, the federal government has really believed that tribal people would not be here much longer. And this is certainly true at this time, um, that through either uh, civil, civilizing them or assimilation or removal, that the indigenous people would not be part of the United States of America and therefore re referencing them 
um, having a whole section, for instance, would not have made sense. We're noted in the Commerce Clause and it's very separate from the tribes. Um, most federal interaction with tribes into this day and point has comes from that. And of course the treaties, like I mentioned earlier, a lot of tribes have treaties with the United States. Those treaties have language in them as long as the sun rises, as long as the water flows, as long as the eagles soar, right? Words that make it in perpetuity. And so these treaties made with the United States and the tribes under the constitution, all treaties are supreme law of the land, meaning they supersede congressional law, um, they supersede uh, executive orders or um, actions to the president. They, are, they should be at the top, but unfortunately the truth also exists that um, every single treaty that the United States has with the tribe has been violated in some format. Now, we let move to a removal era. You've probably heard about the Cherokee Trail of Tears. Um, this was a period of time where the, the conflicts over land intensified that we got federal law passed that would move tribal people or the president could negotiate with them. Uh, unfortunately, at this time, many of these agreements weren't necessarily signed by people from the tribe or people who had the authority. You know, local um, pressure intensified to the point where there was tension even within tribal communities about whether they should stay um, or whether they should leave and go west of the Mississippi where they were promised they would be left alone and be free to live as they wanted. Um, but along the trail, um, thousands and thousands of people did die. Most of the removals occurred in the late summer into the fall and early winter. Um, for the Cherokee who were moved over to Oklahoma, um, I don't know if any of you are from Oklahoma uh, or have lived through an ice storm uh, down there, but you know it will rain at a freezing level, and the it will like the ice will stick to you. Um, you will see huge trees bent over from the weight of the ice, and then as the day progresses and it warms up, the tree pops back up. Um, but the the weather was disastrous. Um, for the community. Also, you know, the official records are around 10,000 uh, Cherokees died along the um, removal. But in 1800, the 1830s, um, did women have any legal status? Right? We did not. Um, children also had no legal status. And so the actual missionaries and soldiers who went along, their accounts of who died are three and four times higher than that because they're also counting the women and children who died along the way, whereas the official counts would have only counted the adult men. And then the 1850s, or you know, into the late 1800s, this is the uh, when reservations were created and reservations, um, which still exist today, uh, it came up because all these tribes moved west of the Mississippi, promised to be alone right? Um, and then we struck gold in California. And so all these people crossed over to get rich and they got tired. So no one knew how big the United States was, right? So at some point they decided, you know, just to live where they were. And so they stopped, dropped and set up um, homesteads, which conflicted with the tribes. And so we start to see the Indian Wars building. This is where you'll see dime store stories about the tribes coming in and attacking farmers and kidnapping their women, um, you know, killing their children or stealing their children. You know, a lot of that was marketing um, to help justify kind of moving tribes into very set areas and intense assimilation, right? Again, not being seen as, as full human, but seeing as you know, more animals uh, that needed to be domesticated. So these reservations were set aside for where tribal people were to remain and settlers knew they couldn't go there. Um, at this time too, it's why when you hear people who might say something off it like, well, that's off the res. It's a deeply offensive saying because off the res refers to the fact that during the reservation era, um, for a tribal member to be found off their reservation was a capital crime. They would be presumed to have been out attacking farmers, stealing livestock, uh, basically committing crimes. Uh, so off the res, 
you know, we say it, you know, you hear it in kind of slang as meaning or doing things very different or, you know, being kind of a rebel. Um, it, it really isn't. It's a phrase that refers to Indians being murdered because they were trying to, for instance, hunt and get food for their families. Um, and then the Indian Wars is the, the oldest, longest lasting war in the United States. Um, it went on for like almost 60 years. And it's a recognized war by the US War Department. But it's not something we also learn in school. Uh, it's not talked about at all. Even though like the Civil War in contrast, that was only a couple of years, right? The Revolutionary War a couple of years, right? Uh, the wars we learn a lot about that had such a huge impact in this country um, were very short in comparison to the Indian Wars that took place. And ultimately, um, crushed, right? Uh, what crushed the, the rebellion or the wars themselves were the fact that we moved into a period of assimilation and the children started being taken away and sent to boarding schools, which did have a huge impact uh, on the tribal communities. I mean, they would. Uh, the picture in the upper right here is actually the, the first graduating class from the Carlisle Indian Industrial School. Um, these children uh, were sent there. Captain Pratt started the school as a way to help Indian children, to help the native people. Uh, in fact, he was seen as a great humanitarian of his time. Um, these schools are where uh, children were forced to cut their hair, where, as you can see, uh, you know, more normal, uh, less indigenous attire. Uh, they were taught English, they were taught trades, the girls were taught how to be homemakers um, or maids. But it was also a, a, um, a place of intense abuse, uh, mental, emotional, sexual. Um, all boarding schools have unmarked graves around them. I'm glad we're starting to hear about that now, particularly as the movement came out of, uh, kind of the awareness came out of Canada. Um, but, you know, children did die and the, the schools didn't send them back to their families. So there are efforts now going on to kind of identify those spots and, and to ensure that at least the remains are returned to the tribes um, that the children came from. But one little um, note many people don't know, they may know about Captain Pratt and the boarding schools, but that first class there, their parents, particularly their fathers, but not in all instances, because women fought too, are those who were um, at Custer's last stand. Uh, the Battle of um, uh, Bighorn. We call it greasy grass, but um, bighorn is what it's known as more often. Um, those children were a condition Congress put on Captain Pratt that they would be the first class. Um, all the children of those who fought at Custer's last stand uh, because they needed to really like stop all the fighting and it, and it worked uh, soon after the, the Indian Wars ended. And then the other thing going on at this time, right, um, with this assimilation, like the narrative here is that we are going to rescue Indian people who are just not able to civilize themselves, that their traditions, their ceremonies, their religions are uh, pagan, they are dangerous, and so we're going to help them. I think it's important even in a modern context when we look back in the past that we recognize a lot of these efforts were done with well-meaning, um, even though they were very, very harmful. The Dawes allotment, the citizen, the boarding school era, this also was a period where land was transferred from tribes and um, from the community and became open for more settlement. And then as I noted, this is also the period of time when we had the world's exposition in Chicago that focused on Columbus. So you can see it's not, on, it, it's not surprising that Columbus, who even at this time would have been known to have kind of had a pretty intense, negative, harmful effect on indigenous people, um, would be seen as, as something separate because the country at large saw native people as in need of being rescued and no longer being savages. Uh, so there wasn't, you know, there wasn't a connection made that, well, Columbus, why would we celebrate him when he murdered all those people? People didn't see, you know, dominant culture didn't see those people as people. They were othered in a way that it wasn't a surprise. 
And we also see at this point, right, a lot, a huge increase because from the 1920s on, there's kind of this idea because of assimilation, um, the boarding schools, this intense effort that there aren't any more Indians. Like they're becoming American citizens. Um, and so now things that used to represent native people are being appropriated by others for their, their own benefit. So we see a lot of calendars, marketing, um, and if you, if you can see the names, you know, Wada Hundi, you know, for the, the girl there in the middle, uh, but the peace pipe that, you know, one is holding, the drum, the feathers, right? These are all ceremonial items that at this point in time were illegal for native people to have. Um, at the end of the 1800s, our ceremonies and religions were banned. Um, and it wasn't until the 1970s that those, that the Freedom of um, Indian Religion Act was passed so that we could again um, practice our, our own ceremonies. So it was used for marketing and, and you know, sexualizing of native women, but native people couldn't use it for themselves in the um, honest and accurate way. This is also a period of time where Boy Scouts of America uh, started creating their camps that would honor native people by allowing members to become um, Indians. So the entire camp, all of these pictures, are, none of these kids are Indian or native, and they are practicing um, traditions and ceremony in essence that would have been illegal for a Native American to do at this time. I don't believe there is there is many doing this anymore, but there's still some camps around where p kids go um, and they're given fictitious native names and you know taught how to um, be an Indian in essence. Then during the termination era, we again had a narrative of like native people just can't take care of themselves. Um, the reservations and the tribal governments were really impoverished and struggling. Um, you know, for those of us now who study historic trauma uh, and multi-generational trauma, that should not be a surprise given what had happened in the past 100 years to the tribal people. Um, but now the federal government is like, let's just get rid of recognizing governments and we're going to adopt all the children out and relocate Indians to urban areas. And so these are pictures from the time, Chicago, Denver, um, asking Indians to come, move into the cities. Uh, you'll be able to get jobs and, and opportunity and you'll, be, you know, you'll have all these good things if you just stop living uh, amongst your people and acting, essentially acting like an Indian. Come into the urban area and you know, act like a civilized individual. And then we move, uh, it's interesting how very few people also know about the Indian civil rights movement that was directly connected and overlapped uh, with the African-American civil rights movement of the South. In fact, uh, I love the picture in the upper right because it shows kind of the diversity of individuals that were working on this kind of civil rights for all, but history has also teased the, the kind of two movements apart in a way that we think there wasn't this combined effort. Um, when you talk about, talk to individuals who were at the time, um, they will be very clear that there was joint conversations, there was strategizing collectively on how to um, liberate all people who were of color or indigenous. But I, I encourage you to just kind of Google some of these things to see what all this meant if you don't know about it. Um, the survival schools uh, were a response here in the urban Minnesota Twin Cities area because school systems were doing such a bad job with native kids. And of course the Indian Child Welfare Act, which we're hearing right now from the Supreme Court just heard arguments and they could overturn it, uh, which would be a shame. And then of course, like I said, I'm sorry, the Religious Freedom Act was passed. So when I was eight years old, um, it was the first time that I would be legally able to smudge, to participate in powwow, to, uh, in essence, celebrate ceremonies uh, and religions, for lack of a better word, that were native. Prior to that, they were banned. Now, all that activism also created another wave of kind of media. So again, instead of seeing native people as individuals or narrative, you know, as a, a community, um, their identity and image started being used to, again, market. Um, these are all from the 70s and late 60s. Um, 
but the headdress on women, right, you probably have hopefully heard by now is actually not appropriate. A Plains Indian, it's only by men. It is um, gained, each feather is gained through different acts. Uh, it's a thing of honor, uh, but often now used in these kind of highly sexualized way. And I, the one in the middle, the Giorgio di Sant'Angelo, I don't know, I'm probably saying the individual's wrong. This Italian designer uh, who did this whole like ethnic design in the in 1970 and 71 uh you know that picture in the middle top I, I mean when I think that is like the epitome of cultural appropriation uh, because that's not even just Native American there are African patterns in there there are um traditional uh, indigenous Norwegian um like it is it's at laughable at this time but you know, I'm sure those outfits were you know thousands and thousands of dollars at time. And of course, um, good old Raquel Welch down there in her Ojibwe designed beaded suede dress, um, very sexy, and also wearing a Southwest jewelry. So this kind of pan Indian approach uh, here too. But unfortunately, not much has changed. It's getting harder to find people. Um, doing this kind of stuff uh, because there's public shaming that goes on now at a level that didn't happen before. Um, but you can still go on Target and buy you know, a teepee for your dog, right? I mean, so uh, you can still go online and order headdresses from people who will make them for you uh, and then wear them um, if you'd like, right? So it hasn't stopped. But, you know, we do hear, and I've heard this too, like it was so long ago, like, what does it matter now? Like, let it go. Let's, let's live in the present. Well, those narratives <laughs> um, about us being savages, about, about needing to be, you know, educated, to be assimilated, to be given opportunity, right, basically have just been used to justify uh, the theft of all the land resources. And unfortunately, I don't get into it much, but a lot of violence that was perpetuated against us as well. And so if we aren't taught indigenous history um, and it's not accurately taught, I, I know there's one textbook that describes the removals, the Cherokee tale of Trail of Tears um, and all of that into a sentence where it says, you know, uh, Native Americans move to make room for settlers. It, oh, that's all it says about the entire experience, right? That they voluntarily basically left. Um, so people will fill in the gap then. They will fill in those gaps with what they've seen on TV, what they've read in books, which is often stereotypical. You know, the um, mascots, you know, dressing up, uh, the Indians are alcoholics. Uh, the really, I hear this too, like you don't look like an Indian or like, how much are you? Um, you know, we're the only um, like race of, racial classification of people where we're asked to provide a percentage in order to justify the fact that we are. My husband, on the other hand, is German. When people ask him, you know, where are you from? He's like, he'll, he'll say, I'm German. No one asks him how much. Like no one asks him uh, like full-blooded or not. Um, but that is a, a, a common experience for those of us in the Native community. And of course, this, you know, I'll be an Indian with a casino um, joke by Bill Keen, and that was just 20 years ago. But we hear lots of, of kind of stereotypes uh, about us. And why we need to let that go? Well, you know, these false narratives about us if you are an individual in a position of authority and power that has, for instance, the ability to make decisions about resource allocation, if you don't understand the history and the multi-generational effects of like housing, homelessness, um, violence, et cetera, then you're not going to include kind of the indigenous perspective when you're creating policy decisions. And unfortunately being less than 2% of the population because genocide has been very effective um, we're, there's not enough of us to really scream and raise, you know, a lot of uh, loud voices to drive stuff. So we need everyone to kind of let go of what you've heard, any kind of stereotypes and start seeing Native people for, for who they are and not a historic relic, but people who exist and have experiences now. 
Because once you see us as people instead of a historical thing, um, you can also start to see where there's intersections amongst us as well as with other communities. You can see nuances between the urban population and you know, tribal communities that live in the reservations. Uh, essentially, you start to see us as people who are human beings with all the complexities and uh, beauty that all people have when you start to really learn about them. Because we're not a thing of the past. We are modern, we're current. There are Indians all over making significant contrib contributions um, to all areas of art, industry, labor, right, medicine. But we don't hear about them that often. And so here are a few of my favorites. Um, Deb Hallen, who is the Secretary of Interior. She is the first native person, excuse my dog, post office is here now, postman. First Secretary of Interior who's native. And the Secretary of Interior, the Interior Department oversees the Bureau of Indian Affairs. It oversees all land, right? This agency has more intersection with tribal communities and tribal interests than any other. And this is the first time a native person has run it and we've seen an impact. Um, we see um, Mary in the upper right, who is the first Alaskan native to serve in Congress, and they're all, they only have one congressional house seat. So she's a former tribal judge, and now she will be in Congress helping to uh, drive policy. Of course, Sharice um, down in the bottom corner, David, she's also a, a congressman. She's a U.S. representative from Kansas, and she's Ho-Chunk. And then my favorite, because I'm biased is Peggy Flanagan, who's an enrolled member of the White Earth Nation here in Minnesota, and she is our Lieutenant Governor. And she is the highest ranking native woman in public office um, today and was just reelected. So we've got another four years under um, her and Governor Walsh's leadership, which is really exciting. But well, we're writers, musicians, actors, right? Louise Erdrich is an amazing author. You should look up her books if you've never read them. Um, Anthony, um, He's, uh, I believe he's Mohican, but he's also um, Inu Inuit, no, in, I know he's Alaskan, uh, has some Alaskan blood in him too, uh, and Cree, uh, Joy Harjo, um, who is Cherokee and Creek, she is the 23rd Poet Laureate of the United States, and of course, right, also one of my favorite, right, Jason, uh, he's pretty yummy, and he's a Native Hawaiian and Samoan, as well as his mom has some Native American um, in her as well. Activist Winona LaDuke, um, who ran under the Green Party uh, for vice president some time ago. She's Ojibwe and now huge in environmental issues. Nick Tilson, who is Lakota from Pine Ridge, has started a whole Indian collective um, movement and, and activism foundation. We have Eloise um, Cobell, who unfortunately passed away. She was is Blackfoot and was responsible for the Cobell litigation, which uh, really raised awareness about the mishandling of trust uh, resources that the federal government had and resulted in the largest class act settlement uh, against the United States that's ever happened, existed. And of course, my friend Abigail Echohawk, who's Pawnee um, and has done a lot of work around murdered and missing Indigenous women and relatives. Uh, and she is from Seattle and the Urban Indian Health Board out there. She's their, I think, dir director. Uh, chefs and restaurateurs, there's a whole movement. Um, Sean Sherman in the upper right, Hillel Echo Hawk, there's a lot of Echo Hawks uh, in Indian country um, who have started restaurants. Sean Sherman uh, just won a prestigious award for the best restaurant. Um, and I can't, James Pate, no, I'm embarrassed. I can't remember what it is, but I know I'm running out of time. So look it up. Uh, look in your areas to see if there are indigenous chefs or restaurants around um, because we are a lot more than just fry bread as well. Sean, for instance, and Hillel, they both cook in pre-colonial foods, meaning no processed flour, no processed cane sugar. Um, and it may sound like, ooh, uh, but they do remarkable food. In fact, Sean makes really good crickets. Um, that tastes like nutty little um, crunchy bits. Um, artists and architects, here are some um, Angela Two Stars, um, did a beautiful piece at the Sculpture Garden uh, in Minneapolis in replace of an unfortunate art exhibit that included the um, mock-up of the 
gallows that hung the Mankato 38 uh, that was offensive to the Dakota people, of course. Uh, we have Tammy Eagle Bull over up in the upper right. Um, she owns Encompass Architects. We have Sam Obixen on the bottom left, who's an enrolled member of the White Earth Nation and has done a lot of work around indigenous design. And of course, Jonathan and Thunder, who is a graphic artist and designer, um, who actually uh, designed the logo that I use for the Tribal State Relations Office, and he's from Red Lake. And there's many more of us, but at the end of the day, like we are still here. Uh, we haven't gone anywhere. Despite a lot of efforts for many, many years, we are still here. And it's, you know, we're fun to get to know. Um, so I encourage you all to, to do a little educating on yourself, right? Uh, make sure you're learning about tribes and you're standing on um, and across the country, as well as tribal communities. Uh, if you're in urban areas, there's probably an urban center of, of resources and or art or culture that you can also learn. Um, respect that, you know, traditional healing and medicines are, are they're, they're real. Uh, they're not just new agey stuff that people have appropriated. Uh, because we're only 2%, we really need you to help amplify us when you're in spaces where we're being overlooked. Um, if it's political, social, health, education, data points, right? I hear often, well, we don't have enough data to include Native American. It's like, well, yes, you're, that's right. There aren't many of us because of genocide. So I know you can do data in a way that you can also articulate that. In fact, when you do that, for instance, here in, in Minnesota, unfortunately, we have the highest overdose rate in the nation for Native people. And if the same amount of white people died last year from an opioid overdose as Native people, that would be almost 8,000 people. If you put data in a way that people will appreciate, then people will see the problem uh, and how it's impacting my community. And of course, we're in the present. Don't use this as past and, and Kato, avoid native inspired stuff and instead not look for native people to buy from. There's a lot of them on, on the internet now. It's kind of an excited period. And you know, it's getting better, but just this morning I had a mascot conversation with someone. Um, every time we're used as a thing, that erases us as people. And then we're just an it. So you don't hear our stories. It continues stereotypes and it hurts. So stop it. <laughs> and so that is it. I think I'm like three minutes over. I apologize for that. Um, I want to thank you for listening to me. Um, and here's my contact information too. If there's follow-up questions, if we don't have time, I can stay on, but okay. I know other people have things. Right. I mean, I'm telling you, Patina, that was so amazing, so beautiful. I know that there are several people that have to leave, and we just want to thank you for spending your hour with us. But for those of you who can hang around, um, Patina has so graciously said that she would hang back just a little so she could answer some questions. And we do have a couple in there that um, I'll toss out. But before I do, excuse me, I'm so glad that I muted myself. Because as you were talking, the things I was saying, and I'm thinking, oh my God, I'm so glad I'm muted. Um, the, um, the, yeah, yeah, I um, brought up a lot of emotions and, um, and I feel you. And I, I think we're all should be talking about each other like this. And it's, it's us, it's, mm -hmm. it's not you and me, it's us, it's us, it's us. And so I feel you. Um, there were, I'll share this one question and that, um, uh, well, maybe more than one. Um, and it is, um, how were children placed for adoption? Were their parents forced to give up their children or were they taken by force by the government? I got to tell you, when I heard some of this, the first time I heard you speak, oh my God, it almost sent me reeling to the floor. Okay. Oh. Well, yes, the, um, in the 40s, 50s, and 60s, um, there was this whole movement um, to kind of rescue Native children. And so like the um, federal government funded programs that would help adopt 
Native children out. And so there are various ways they would collect them. Number one, like remembering like social services still existed. And so um, if a child was found, for instance, with a grandma instead of with their parent, um, you know, then it was seen as abandonment. And if the grandma couldn't prove a court gave her custody, um, then they would rescue the child from grandma. Uh, there are instances, many documented, where a Native woman would, would give birth in a hospital and be told that there was a problem with her child, that they needed to keep the child for observation or for treatment. Now, often Native people couldn't just stay there and wait, like they had other children, like so they'd have to leave and come back. And when they'd come back, they'd be told their child died, when in fact the child had been moved to a different hospital and told that it had been abandoned. And so um, it was so pervasive, though, that um, more children were moved this way than when you combine all the boarding school eras together. And boarding schools started in the beginning, right? It wasn't until the late 1800s that they became a federally subsidized kind of program from the government. Before that, there were boarding schools out east that were run a lot by the churches. Um, and children would be snatched which is, you know, um, so they call it, we call them split feathers, broken feathers, are those individuals who are adopted out. In fact, out East, there, there are little pockets of um, Jewish Native Americans because the Jewish community was targeted as an adoption resource because we looked more like them. And so if they could place a Native kid um, with a, a Jewish family that looked similarly, then they would never even have to tell the child they were Native. Um, whereas if you place it with a blonde haired, blue eyed, right, Swedish family in Minnesota, they stick out. Oh my and that occurred, that went all the way up until the Indian Child Welfare wow. Act in 1978, um, which found up to one in three of all Native kids were out of the home and in foster care placement and in white foster homes to be adopted out. Um, so that's also why the, the ICWA, which is in front of the Supreme Court now for consideration, um, it would be disastrous if it were to be um, overturned because it requires noticing tribes, it requires placement with family. It's kind of the gold ribbon of child welfare practices that even non-native child welfare practices now model. Mm, 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 mm. Uh, yeah, um, I wish we had time for more. Um, um, unfortunately, I have another meeting that I have to attend. Patina, this was absolutely positively fabulous. I have never heard you and not just bowled over by the things you share, the historical perspective, the deep um, information that has been withheld from the public for, from the beginning, from the beginning. And, and each time it uproots some other era <clears throat> error that I have in my head about what I was taught over the years. So thank you so very, very much. I truly hope we get you again. Um, and anytime, I, Fanny. I will come back anytime. I know you're wonderful. Thank you so very much. And we want you to have the best day ever. And, and to you and all of you, as well. and if people want to send their questions to my email, I'll answer them for you later too. Okay, well, we'll send the, we'll just take these questions and send them on to you. Thank you so much for your kindness. And we appreciate you and everything that you do. All right. Well, Palatanka, everyone. Take care. You too. Okay. Bye-bye. Mm,